Shalom this morning. Welcome to our Bible study once again. Friday morning, those who have joined us, we want to welcome each and every one of you. Thank you. As we continue in the book of Jeremiah, our head of Jews for Jesus, Australasia, will do customarily what he does, teach us, and we'll invite you back in for a Q&A. By the way, the Q&A is not recorded. So if you would like to be part of our live Zoom on Friday mornings, please send us an email at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au and we will send you a link. If you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please subscribe and press like. That will get people to join us, and that in itself is a good thing. So without further ado, Bob Mendelson, please take it away. Thank you, Jimmy, and thank you everyone for being on the call today. If you haven't yet read the chapter, chapter 35 of Jeremiah, you on YouTube, would you please pause your playback, read the chapter, and then rejoin us. Thanks. Welcome back. You might have seen the list of excuses that floats around companies and workstations. It's designed to help you to stop making excuses and get to work. Some of them are funny, but really all of them are spot on target. Let me name, I'll just name four of them. Excuse number one, I didn't know, or I wasn't told. Excuse number two, we've always done it that way. The corollary is, We've never done it that way before. Excuse number three, it's not my responsibility, that's another department. Excuse number four, I didn't know you wanted it done now. No matter what people say, you and I both know none of these excuses holds water. We might try to skirt our responsibilities, but the reality is if there's work to do, and it's our personal or even our corporate capability to make it happen, then we should do so. The corollary to number two is what I'm thinking about today as I read Jeremiah chapter 35. We've never done it that way before. Here we see a group of people named the Rechabites whose original ancestor, Rechav, lived about 300 years before this particular incident. And as we see in this reading, they continue his instructions, especially about not drinking. And thus the scene, the dinner with drinks, invitation to the temple, will be met with sanity and refusal rather than what would have been the case if we were looking at chapter 34. Remember, last week we saw that chapter and its people do the ridiculous thing of keeping Hebrew slaves and not releasing them as would be both socially sensible, biblically required, and physically helpful to the slaves themselves. The contrast couldn't be clearer. Chapter 34, how not to behave. Chapter 35, how to behave. And I'm titling this episode, Give Me That Old Time Religion, to remind me and you, if a religion is old, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, to be fair, old isn't always right either, but what we have to learn is that what matters is who's talking and what he's asking, and then get on with it without excuses. Let's dig into our chapter today and what, see what it has to say to us as 21st century people. Verse 1, the source of this interaction is the Word of God. Here's what it says. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, <laughs> please don't tire of this. Don't weary yourself in figuring out how to sort things out on your own. If you're a believer, you have an avenue. You have a channel, a connection with God. That means he can speak with you and to you. He can advise you well. He wants to advise you well and to lead you to make the world a better place. Not because you're so clever or wise, although both of those are great traits to seek, but because he, the all wise, can and will speak with you. We've seen it before. And again, in chapter 35, we see this. 32 times in this little chapter of 19 verses, 
Three Hebrew words show up in various forms. Davar, meaning word or speak. Amar, meaning say. And Shema, meaning to hear and usually implies obedience. You don't have to be very clever yourself to sort out what the emphasis is in this chapter. Listen to what God has already said and say, yes, sir. That's pretty much it. Well, let's continue with the whole chapter in our line by line study as is our custom. Verse two, Jeremiah is told to go to the house of the Rechabites, meaning the family of, or the leader of the clan of the Rechabites. Who, who were those folks anyway? They're, they're, that's the first introduction to them that we have here in the prophecy of Jeremiah. So who are they? We have to revisit two passages in the Older Testament. First in 1 Chronicles chapter 2 and second in 2 Kings chapter 10. 1 Chronicles 2 says this, The families of scribes who lived at Yabez were the Tirathites, the Shimeathites, and the Sukathites. Those are the Kenites who came from Hamath of the father of the house of Rechab. Huh. Rechab, if this is the same one, and I have no reason to doubt that it is not the same. There's too many negatives. I have no reason to doubt this must be the same guy. He is a Kenite. But the point Jeremiah makes is not the head of the family, Rechab, but rather the family of the Rechabites. For that, we need to visit 2 Kings chapter, uh, both chapters 9 and 10. There we meet the, the future king, Yehu, Jehu, who was the son of Jehoshaphat. And Yehu was anointed king by some of the school of the prophet Elisha, or Elisha in 2 Kings 9. And he's charged to go decimate the house of Ahab and Jezebel. You might remember them. Jehu is violent and he is thorough. In 2 Kings 9, Jehu assassinates Yoram, then he assassinates Ahaziah and gets rid of Jezebel, splat on the ground. There is a storm of destruction and ruin almost at every turn. Chapter 10 begins with Jehu killing relatives of the dead, and then he encounters Rechab beginning at verse 15. 2 Kings 10, verse 15. We read this. Now, when Yehu had departed from there, he met Yehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he greeted him and said to him, Is your heart right as my heart is with your heart? <laughs> if, if you go back in the chapter and hear how Yehu greets people, it's often with that same kind of language, and then he ends up killing them. <laughs> Yehonadab, that's the son of Rechab, uh, answers and says, yeah, my heart's right. My heart's with your heart. He says, it is. Yehu says, here, give me your hand. <laughs> and he gives him his hand and he pulls him up into the chariot. He said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. And he made this son of Rechab, Yehonadab, later Yonadab, they just shortened his name, uh, to ride in the front seat, if you will. And when he came to Samaria, he killed all who remained to Ahab in Samaria until he had destroyed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. <laughs> what might you have been feeling if you were Yehonadab, the son of Rechab? This guy who brought you into the front seat of his Uber of death is still carrying a sword and you probably not. You've listened to your father and his words of nonviolence, and really his words of separation from the madness of the city folks. He wanted the Rechabites not to build houses, but to stay in tents. They were not to sow seed, meaning not to run a farming industry, not to plant vineyards. They were to remain mobile, not fixed, and not to drink wine. Business as usual, not for the Rechabites. So the Rechabites were to live long in the land, and we see that in our chapter today. And as evidenced in Jeremiah's time, they had lived so far 300 years without homes, without providing for themselves. They were trusting the Lord. 
Now, before you get all taken with their spirituality, the point of Jeremiah is telling us about this episode, if I read it right, is to point to the contrast and not the mechanics of their life in God. Contrast chapters 35 and 34, not chapter 35 and your life. God may want you to live as a hermit or a mobile mendicant and ambassador, but everyone is not called to be the same thing. What we're called to be is obedient and observant and people who spend time with the Lord of life, not necessarily as beggars. When we meet these Rechabites here in chapter 35 of Jeremiah, they're invited to a party of some significant celebration at the temple in Jerusalem. Verse 4, the details are clear. This is a magnificent room with celebrity figures as nameplates and visible ceremony. Have you ever been invited to a fancy schmancy venue and you actually have to worry about getting a new suit, polishing your new shoes, perhaps getting a haircut? The ball is not ordinary life. The intimidation factor of going to Buckingham Palace or the White House, Casa Rosada in Buenos Aires, this is substantial and could be overwhelming to people who might nickname themselves Lonsmen, Paisanos, people of the land. Think of the 1960s sitcom, The Beverly Hillbillies and the Clampets traveling to California, coming to Beverly Hills for the first time or just Cinderella approaching the ball that night. Then in verse five, Jeremiah places pitchers, really bowls full of wine and tells them, drink up. Look, already they're outside their comfort zone. And now this prophet, or at least this person of some significance who has enough capital to buy bowls of wine, He's inviting them to a banquet and firstly to imbibe on the delicacies. These are people who for 300 years haven't tasted the liquor of the day. Verse six, they say, our fathers didn't and they commanded us not to drink. And in verse seven, they repeat the further commandments which came with a promise to live on. Uh, they're better defined as sojourners. By the way, the Hebrew word for sojourner here is from the word ger, it's gur, meaning stranger. And like the Kenites before them, they were not Jews, but they had taken on Jewish ways and even Jewish names. And probably they were like unto converts. Barnes says this, quote, wine is the symbol of a settled life because the vine requires time for its growth and care in its cultivation, while the preparation of the wine itself requires buildings, and it then has to be stored up before it's ready for use. The drink of nomads consists of the milk of the herds." End quote. Verse eight, they say, hey, look, that's our commitment, and it's our history, and it's our future with our wives and kids also. Verse 9, no houses. Verse 10, in a positive way, we dwell in tents. So making us come to this banqueting table in this illustrious venue, well, sir, it's not for us. That's not the us we've been. That's not the us we want to be. Verse 11, Nebuchadnezzar came and unsettled the countryside, and we had to move into town. That's bad enough. That's against our protocols, but that's the line in the sand for us. We're done with breaking our great, great granddaddy's rules. God bless these folks. By the way, Rechav is the Hebrew word for ride or mount. And that makes good sense since they are nomads. Oh, and the uh, modern Hebrew word for the train, Rakevet, same root. This takes me on a journey with the sojourners. This is a word of action and mobility, being on the move, Rachevet. They're not to be stationary. But again, don't miss this. It's not about being aliens, although you could read that as pres prescriptive for the people of God. This is not about not drinking, although if that's what you hear from heaven, so be it. 
No, the point of the story today is the contrast with the people 17 years later in chapter 34, who disregard what God has said and enslave fellow Jewish people. Look at verse 12 and following. <clears throat> verse 13, God tells Jeremiah to tell the Judeans and especially the Jerusalem folks to compare and contrast their lives with those of the Rechabites. Verse 14, their fathers gave commands and the children obeyed. But I've spoken to you, Hashkem Vadaber. That's an idiom. And it's an unusual one. Hashkem, rising early, Vadaber, and speaking. But none of your versions translate it, rising early and speaking. Probably like mine it says again and again, I've spoken to you <laughs> rising early and speaking. But this morning I told you, this afternoon I'm telling you, tonight I'm telling you again, I'm telling you again and again. Sometimes I think some one of your versions translates it persistently. Uh, the point is, you've heard this. <laughs> you've heard it again and continually, and yet you missed it. Verse 15, same thing, hush came, and you disregarded the prophets. So it's not just me. You, you, you blew off all the guys who came before you. You didn't even incline your ear. Much more you didn't observe. Verse 16, compare the Rechabites did, you didn't. Then the final sentence to the Judeans in verse 17, I'm bringing judgment. No escape. It's coming because I tried and tried and you blew me off. You refused. Look, I had a serious conversation 18 months ago, I think, with a Jewish man. This was back in the U.S. in the center. I think it was in Kansas City. And as we sat together at a, a place where I, a Messianic Jewish place, uh, he told me of, uh, of four different epiphanies he had. It was as if God spoke to him this way. And then uh, a month later, I forget the timeline, uh, uh, God spoke to him yet again. And he told me about four episodes, four specific intersections of his life with, uh, uh, of his life with the Almighty. And yet, you know what he said? Uh, maybe just one more. Maybe if God speaks to me, then I'll get it. And I think, who, who deserves more? He's already spoken to you. Hashkem Badaber. He's from rising early. He told you already. How, how many do you deserve? Zero. How many did he give you? One? Great. It's then shot. Then listen and obey. Two, three, four. Who deserves more? It's a shake my head moment from Jeremiah, from God, towards the Jewish people who were disregarding, not regarding, not even inclining, not even giving it a possible idea. Hmm. I don't know the status of that man. He was an older man, which means older than me. And we will see what the status is uh, when I go back there in November. Verses 18 and 19, God's plan for the Rechabites was a good plan. The obedience to their father was noted and to be rewarded. Don't get confused. Obedience is good. Obedience is right. Doing what God wants is excellent. That's exactly what he wants. In the same way, if you as a parent told your children you want them to set the table for dinner, or wouldn't it be nice if you drove over and took that to your uncle uh, when he needed it. Things like that. And, you, and the child or the adult child uh, performs, you say, well done. You know, you want to be able to commend. At the same time, you want to be very careful that you don't, um, that you don't make a religion out of works, that you don't make a religion of things that you do or don't do. You don't do the things you don't, that you want to be careful not to make God a rewarder of all those who perform on his behalf. That's not the point. 
The point today is listen, learn, and perform, but not so that God um, gives you extra points, but so that God and you maintain your relationship. That's the key, maintaining the relationship. The word always, that could be confusing there at the end of the chapter. It may be confusing. It doesn't mean forever into 2022 and beyond. It means for a very long time. And that's a worthy consideration. There, there may not be a Kenite in your neighborhood or at your congregation. Um, it's the same phrase that was used of the priests and of David's throne. And we know that that was, uh, how should we say, uh, for a substantial length of time, but not, remember the terms we used, horizons one, two, and three didn't always exist in Horizon 1. Well, there you go. That is the way I see chapter 35, and hopefully the way you see it, that you might hear from heaven what God wants for you with your friends, with your relatives, with your next door neighbor. How are you supposed to live in these days? And then go and do it. And if you do, you won't earn points but you'll keep up your relationship with the God who wants everybody to know him personally. Jimmy, let me turn it back over to you, brother. I don't know where you sit this morning after hearing that message. Did you hear the cry of God's heart for you? Relationship, he desires relationship with you. Something that we as humans just so seek is to have a relationship, whether it's with one another. But think of this, the living God, the creator of heaven and earth wants to have a relationship with you and he has made a way. And it is through his son who came and lived and died and on the third day rose again that you and I might have life and life more abundantly. For as many as received him, he gave them the authority and the right to become the sons of the living God. Oh, sons, including daughters, let's not leave you out. I would never do such a thing. But this is the relationship he talks about. Have you taken a moment to do such? If you have not, please pray with me. Father, I want to know that son. I want to know that relationship and that connection. I want to be in right relationship with you. And I heard that you made a way for me. And that way is through the cross. And I could know your mercy, your grace, and your forgiveness through the cross. So today, I just take a moment to say yes. Yes to you, yes to your message. The message of forgiveness, for grace, and mercy. If you've prayed anything in line with those words, please let us know at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au. And we'd love to send you some literature. We'd love to stand with you and pray with you. Because you know what? You are part of the family of God. We are in relationship with the God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth today. So thank you once again. And don't forget, next Friday morning, join us in the book of Jeremiah as we continue chapter 36. And I want to say again to you, Shabbat Shalom.